Hello, everybody, and welcome to Gene's Reviews. Reviews from a regular dude. Where I do trailer reactions, I react to YouTube videos, I review YouTube channels, occasionally I'll review a movie, but really, I just do whatever the hell I want. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Gene's Reviews. Reviews from a regular dude in my car. Okay, today I'm gonna do something that I haven't done in a long time. I, I used to do quite a few of these. I'm gonna read a story, a short horror story. I guess it doesn't have to be horror, but this one's going to be horror. Well, I think it works best as either horror or maybe comedy, but I'm gonna be doing more of these. And this one's a short horror story that I found here on the World Wide Web. And it's called The Tooth Fairy. But before I get started, if you guys have a Dutch Brothers where you're at, the strawberry smoothie is the bomb. It is so good. I think it's meant as like a meal replacement, but wow, it is so good. I don't get enough fruit in my diet and that strawberry smoothie is really really good I highly recommend it okay this one is called the tooth fairy it is a hot day in this dusty gray city Abe and the rest of the demolition team created much of the dust by tearing down this derelict old building long ago it was considered a trendy boutique hotel this area of the city was once a favored place of bohemian artists, writers, intellectuals, and their hanger-ons, and their hangers-on. It was a kind of Soho wannabe. In the 40s and 50s, you would see the fashionably shabby elite taking coffee or wine at the sidewalk, cafes, and bars, discussing weighty subjects with self-serious smugness talking a little too loud with contrived transatlantic accents, cigarettes in long holders held in stylishly limp hands, waving around to accent a particularly insightful point. They loved art, or what they considered art. The more outrageous, somber, and disturbing, the better. They didn't smile much, preferring disdain and intelligent contempt. But time passed, they outgrew themselves, and most conformed. After all, married, had children, got reliable jobs, and saved for retirement. The few diehards that didn't leave developed liver and lung problems and became shabby for real. It was no longer a fashion statement. The hotel became dingy as well. Room prices lowered and then lowered again and it began to attract the low income, the addicted, and the ne'er-do-wells. And now it is condemned. It is being torn down along with other derelict buildings in the area and will be home to industrial warehouses scattered with a few coffee shops and fast food restaurants to cater to the employees these warehouses will require. Abe has worked for this demolition company for the better part of two years. The money is not great, but not too bad either. It is enough to pay his share of the rent on the dark, dank basement suite he shares with his roommate. He is 40 years old, has a middle-aged gut, is losing his hair, and doesn't care. He quit caring about anything much a few years back. A sad story, boring in its commonness, and certainly nothing remarkable about it. His wife left him. She didn't mind about the gut and the hair, but she did mind his pot use. He is more than a daily user. He is more like an hourly user. The old wake and bake and carry right on until he thankfully drops into oblivion every night. The pot that brings him much, that brings him such relief has stolen everything and he doesn't care. The smash and crash of the wrecking ball have come and gone and now it is down to the details he uses a jackhammer to clean up bits and pieces of stubborn concrete and then he sweeps up the mess 
The acrid dust of the concrete flies in his face, but he uses a bandana to protect his lungs. Kind of a waste of time, given the state of his lungs from constant toking. But he doesn't care. The boss hollers for the crew to take their morning coffee break, and that is his signal to find some out-of-the-way spot to top himself off with a reefer. The boss and others know where he's going and what he's doing, but look the other way, as this city's labor shortage is brutal. They need every man they can get, even the stoners. Break over, he goes back to sweeping, nicely buzzed when his broom hits something, something soft, small. He reaches down to grab it and shake the dust off it. It looks like a rag doll. He turns it over to look at its face drops it in horror. The doll has mismatched button eyes and a wide evil clown type grin and its mouth is full of teeth. Real teeth. Human teeth. Perfect white adult human teeth. Far too big for the small doll's head. The teeth are not in the proper order. There are incisors where the front teeth should be. Next to them, the molars and then the front teeth. What the fuck, he mumbles under his breath. He picks up the creepy doll and pulls back the cottony lips to see how the teeth are fastened. They are held in place by wire. Wire, now rusty with age, but wire. Someone has drilled holes into the top of the teeth, sewn them in the fabric with the wire, and then covered the whole mess with puffy red cotton lips. The doll's body feels full of something hard and small, crunchy like pebbles. There is a small split down the side seam of one of its legs, and he pulls it closer to see what is inside. Teeth. More teeth. The damn thing is stuffed with teeth. Baby teeth, adult teeth, some rotten and worn, broken or with huge cavities, others pristine. Why teeth? And where in God's name would someone get all those teeth? The, ball, the boss hollers at him to get back to work. So he takes the gruesome thing, tucks it in his backpack, and returns to work. He is rather glad to have something for his fuzzy mind to puzzle over while he does his mindless task. When he gets home, he takes out the hoary doll shakes it to remove the last of the dust and has a good long look. What is this thing? He lights, lights a joint, turns on his old laptop. He doesn't use this computer for much other than watching porn and playing internet poker. But now he types into the Google search bar doll with real human teeth. There are results for dolls with teeth. Not actual and not creepy used by Dennis as a teaching tool for children. There's an article about a doll's head made from a coconut shell with real teeth set into drilled holes. This was found in the Florida Everglades and archeologists think it was a voodoo doll from the early 1700s and then bingo. There's an article from a site called WikiArt about an artist who lived in this very city in the same hotel they are now demolishing. Juana Del Mortem. That was her real name, but she would only answer to fairy. Not fairy mine, but fairy with the accent in the last syllable. Fairy. She lived there for a while when the hotel was in its heyday. She was an eccentric, androgynous type before it was cool to be eccentric and androgynous. She never cut her hair, seldom combed or washed it, wore men's fedora hats and ratty hand-me-down coveralls. She rarely wore shoes of any sort, even in cold weather. She was briefly but intensely popular for creating macabre pieces made from genuine human parts and pieces. She made a piece from a gnarly oak stick with human skin stretched over it and stitched together 
on the other side with several thick strands of long gray human hair. It was complete with an actual fingernail, manicured to a sharp dagger-like point and painted blood red. It resembled an elderly human index finger with swollen joints. She would not conform where she got the skin from. She would not confirm where she got the skin from, but it was rumored that the skin was her own, peeled from her inner thigh and then tanned. The fingernail was clearly not her own as she constantly chewed her nails down to a bloody pulp, but she kept her source a, a secret. The wealthy collector who bought it kept it locked under glass as the artist had hinted at its power to deliver a curse if pointed in anger at someone. On the buyer's passing, his wife donated the dreadful thing to a macabre art museum in London, and she was glad to be rid of it. It still resides there today, and is still safely locked under the glass. Her most famous piece was a huge painted skyscape of the city. She had used her own feces as paint, and that paint had unique, intricate, and subtle variations in color. How she got all these colors, she would not say, but swore she added nothing to change the color. It is simply a matter of diet, she would say. When asked about the reddish sunset behind the skyscape, she said, Hemorrhoids, darling. She signed only with an understated F on all her pieces. On the finger piece, the tiny F was scratched on the underside of the nail with the feces piece the F was hidden and the barely decipherable in the corner and barely decipherable in the corner of the of the roof of one of the buildings a shade darker and the surrounding brown you would think it would have been you would think it would have a lingering smell of well feces but it didn't instead there would be a distinct smell of fresh cut thyme emanating from it at odd hours. There were other pieces too. The intact bones of young child's rib cage that had been fashioned as a jail for a coiled stuffed snake, its mouth wide open to show fangs. The jail also had a bow made from a dried umbilical cord tied neatly on the stub at the top of the backbone. Another piece was a human testicle emptied and stretched over a baseball and tattooed with eyes that were both squinted and crossed as a crow's beak attached where the mouth should be. She had covered the top of the head in what looked like blonde pubic hair. It was. The word pecker had been burnt into the skin across the forehead. The more grisly her work, the more popular. She never advertised her art for sale or showed anything in a gallery, but word of mouth did her selling. She would let the would-be buyers argue amongst themselves until the highest bidder went home, proud to own a fairy. As her popularity grew, she started dropping hints that her masterpiece was soon to be revealed. She said it had taken most of her life. At this time, the guess was she was in her mid-forties. It had taken her that long to create. When people asked the theme, she merely smiled wide, stuck her tongue through a gap in her mouth where an incisor was missing. Anticipation rose, and she received offers in the $100,000 range for this piece. Sight unseen, but she would not accept. She started to refer to everyone as doll, wet tongue pushing through the tooth gap. The art sleuths at the time anticipated the masterpiece to be some sort of doll with teeth. Her fans were frantic and tried to curry her favor with wildly expensive meals and drinks and offers to be her patron. She ate and drank but took no money. She was beholding to no one. When they asked her when it would be ready, she smirked and told him, when it's done of course. Then she disappeared, no trace of her, no goodbye, just gone.
The police checked her modest apartment after the missing person report was lodged, but nothing seemed to miss. She was not there, but had left behind a few of her personal possessions. Although no artworks in progress, finished pieces or tools she may have used for her creations. Eventually, her belongings were auctioned off as a collector as collector pieces for outrageously high amounts as her fame and notoriety only grew with her disappearance. To this day, there are some who still seek her masterpiece. If found, it would, re would, it would reportedly be worth millions. Astounded, he looks at the hideous doll, picks it up. He examines it closely, searching for an F. And there, under the doll's faded gingham skirt, almost hidden under the hem, is a small sloppy F, embroidered in black thread. Millions. He could be holding on to millions. This ugly, disgusting find could change his life. He imagines his life with millions. He would buy a fancy high-rise penthouse with floor to ceiling windows and a doorman would call him sir. It would have private underground parking where he would park a perfectly restored classic candy apple red Mustang. Maybe he would get hair implants, buy the expensive pre-rolls instead of rolling his own, and drink boutique beer. He imagines the luxury of waking up and having nothing to do but watch porn, smoke pot, play internet poker and video games. Maybe his wife will come back. He lights another doobie to celebrate. Hell, he even pops open another can of Coors. Well, that's the end of that. I like the story. It just kind of ended kind of abruptly. I don't really care for the ending. What do you think? I think it m might make a pretty cool movie. But that was called The Tooth Fairy. Now it's time for a joke. Why do skeletons like dainty women? They like to bone a petite. Wow. Thank you, everybody. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, hashtag mean gene, all that fun stuff. And if you like this video, tell all your friends. Leave a comment down below. And if you didn't like it, then just shut up. And I will see you next time.